really is my pleasure as well to be here in Dublin and to return to Ireland. Um, I'm married to a Hogan, um, so um, it's, he's, there, he's also happy that we're able to make this trip. And I really appreciate your remarks, Professor, because I think it really dovetails into the kinds of things that I'm going to talk about this morning in terms of restorative justice. What I thought I would do for a moment is try to put this a little bit contextually sort of justice into the conflict management field um, and in the mediation field because they are not two separate rocks that never interact. But in fact, um, as I am also a civil mediator and so um, I frequently, in my mind, am using the restorative practices and restorative techniques that I use in what I will call my classic restorative justice cases while um, working in the mediation field. Um, I, one of the interesting things, and, and I was thinking about this when Mary Robinson was speaking this morning, um, was that um, I'm part of a small group of, of scholars, I'm not one of the scholars, but scholars from Harvard and MIT and Georgetown that write, we write extensively on mediation and negotiation and they've done extensive research and there are about 20 of us and once a year we get together um, on the East Coast and spend a weekend together talking about each other's work and what are the hot issues. And for many, many years um, I was sort of the out duckling in this room. Um, because I was talking about going into prisons and working with survivors of violent crime and they were talking about negotiation and interest-based negotiation and all those topics. And I started talking about my stories and they all would kind of look at me and a few people would cry as I tell my stories. And, um, you know, we, it was like we were two worlds. And I never felt we were two worlds, but he had that sense. And through the years, Many of those um, academics and practitioners are now being called upon to go around the world and to work in a variety of countries that are, that are facing you know, incredible issues, some of which have been covered this morning, and, and work on dealing with conflict, whatever that means in those countries. And it's clear to me that suddenly they're moving into restorative kinds of work that the classic civil mediation model or negotiation model doesn't work sometimes for cultural reasons, sometimes the issues are not how do we get this settled, it's really how do we help restore harm, how do we move on by with a country with a sense of justice and recognition of human rights and it is much more complex and actually I have found in the last several years as we gathered, we're really under the same umbrella lots of times on these discussions. Um, <clears throat> You know, the restorative justice that a lot of people will talk about um, where it came from, and I'm, I'm going to give the definition that I generally use in a minute, um, but restorative justice is based on a lot of older traditions, and again, anybody trying to claim it in recent cultures are just making that up, because most of, most of the processes, whether it be family group conferencing, whether it be healing circles or talking circles, whether it be victim offender dialogue, come from religious backgrounds, indigenous people, the Native Americans um, um, use a lot of the talking circles that we use in the United States. Um, and it's really a sense of community coming and really having deep and meaningful discussions and conversations about harm and ways to be able to repair that harm, move forward, often bring the offender back into that sense of community because there's a brokenness that happens when harm happens. And, and so th those processes are developed uh, in many ways. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about circles and I'm going to talk a little bit about victim offender dialogues and I'm doing a workshop tomorrow more on, on using of circles in community and communities where um, there is brokenness for a variety of reasons. Um, and um, the um, sense of uh, victim offender dialogue, I'm going to concentrate on that for a few moments, the sense that there is an offender and a victim, 
um, which often some people are kind of complex, but we certainly have those kinds of offenses in our community. And what is it we're doing with them? Um, we're not doing classic mediation. We're not trying to necessarily settle the dispute because the conflict and the harm has happened. And if there's no prior relationship, it's not that we're trying to get them back together. What is it we're doing? Well, I, I like the definition of restorative justice that's defined in a tri triangle um, with three points, obviously. The top point being the survivor victim. And for those of you that don't work in with survivors of crime, many people who have suffered crime or harm, and those, I use those terms interchangeably, restorative justice is not just about crime, because crime is what the legislature defined, but harm, um, those people often like to be called survivors, they don't like to be called victims. Their lives have moved on, they have now had tons of power, and they are no longer victims. So that language, I'm going to use them interchangeably, but just so you have a sense that survivors is often the terminology that many like to use. <coughs> Restorative justice is really focused on the victim, survivor, and people around them. We'll get back to that. The second triangle is a sense of community, bringing in the community. Um, and, and, you know, when we do sort of classic one-on-one -on -one mediation, we often don't have the voice of the community in there. Um, other than the, the participants reflect that. But there is a real conscious thought about community and what community means and harm to community. When there's harm to people, there's harm to community. And the third point being, in a classic case, the offender or the perpetrator. And I always put lots of circles around those three triangles. So we get back to the survivor of an offense. Somebody who has been victimized, and we're going to use a crime for this purpose. We know they've been harmed. They can be little, maybe big, maybe devastated, you know, crimes, crimes of severe violence and uh, crimes that change people's lives. There's never there's never a, a going back to what you were before a crime of severe violence. But we also know that people all around that. So if you know people who've been severely victimized, it's not just them. It's their partner, it's their spouse, it's their friends, it's their neighbors, it's their co-workers. And all of us that, that, that are close to that person. And those of you who work with survivors of sexual violence know often the partner is in a worse shape almost than the survivor because they feel guilty, they could have, could have been there, they have a hard, the intimate relationship often changes, they sometimes changes daily as some survivors tell me. And most marriages after a sexual uh, violent act don't make it. The majority of marriages fail just because of the complexity of all that. So there are lots of victims that happen. And what's interesting in our traditional court system, and it's one of the reasons restorative justice, I think, is, is becoming more recognized in sort of the classic uh, criminal justice system, is that the, the victim doesn't have much to say, and those people around him or her have nothing to say in our classic system. Um, the second point is the community. And if you live in a neighborhood where somebody there have been a number of, of criminal acts where there's a rapist running around, there's a burglar running around, and even if you don't know that victim, it impacts you. How you live, how you lock your door, how you look at people on the street, how you classify people, you know, are those young people, are those people of color, or whatever. Whatever you happen to think the offenders are, you start looking and acting differently towards people of that class. And um, sometimes people sell their houses, sometimes children encourage their parents to no longer live in that neighborhood. Those are all ripples that happen from that initial act or multiple acts. And we have large communities. You suddenly have a serial rapist running around Delta, for example. It affects everybody. Or somebody who's molesting children. Suddenly kids are not playing in the yard or playing in the park because everybody's afraid to do it, even though you may not know the victim. Those are all potential victims. Neighborhoods change, shopping centers close. We can go on and on about the ripple effect of crime. And I was talking about the United States, 9-11, which were a series of crimes on that day, changed the world. The world will never be the same um, after that day. Um, whether we go to an airport or whatever it is, immigration, all sorts of things. The third, the third point is the offender. In restorative justice, narrative, that person, if there is one, 
person is treated differently because he or she has said something in the motion that caused all this. So there's an accountability piece and a responsibility piece that I'll get back to. Um, but there are also all sorts of people around that offender that we often forget. The children of the offender, or the mother, or the father, or the partner, the neighbors. And we know at least in the United States, 75% of children of someone who's incarcerated will be incarcerated themselves sometime in their lifetime. Two out of four children, if your parents been in prison or jail, you will be in prison or jail. That's a ripple effect. So we, we, you know, that's, so the first question you ask in restorative justice is who has been harmed by the act? The question is not who did it. The question is not can you prove it in court. That's why it doesn't, this is not an alternative to a fact-finding process, a court process. These things can happen in and outside the courtroom and, I, and, I, and, and do all over the world. Um, in Belgium, they, there are restorative processes involved in the police station before it gets the prosecutor's office. More and more police stations and communities are trying to do restorative things before you ever get into the system. There's a lot of discussion of how it fits in the system that's complex with lawyers and constitutional rights. And I met with a barrister and judge the other day here, and we played, you know, we played the law school game about what if this and what if that and what if he says he did it, and then the case doesn't go ahead. And, and those are all issues that have to be worked out. And it, it also applies to post-conviction, and I met with a number of prison wardens in, in Dublin a couple of days ago as well, who have a lot of interest in trying to um, instigate or try to create restorative justice in prisons. I've been running a prison program for over 20 years in a maximum security prison um, that's been affected. So, it, but in any event, we tend not to look at all the victims that we have understanding. So the first question that I said is who is harmed? And it's all those people. And in different processes, and it's the adjustability that the professor talked about of culture and should you bring family in and you know who gets involved in these processes all gets designed by an experienced facilitator or mediator along working in conjunction with the community that you're involved in, the people you're involved in. The second question is what was the harm? And I just want to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this except to say Judicially, <coughs> we rarely look at the real harm. So, if you look at state and sexual assault, the question is, we'll take a woman um, survivor, which most sexual assault survivors are women, but not all of them. Um, was there a sexual intercourse, a sexual touching without consent? And then, you know, with violence, maybe. We never want to know if she can't sleep at night anymore. We never want to know she can't feel comfortable in her apartment or at work. If it's an acquaintance of assailant that she doesn't trust anybody in her life anymore, we don't want to know what she's like five years later. We don't know. But none of that's relevant to whether this person assaulted. You know, and I used to have people argue, I was a trial court judge for 12 years, and my last assignment was assaults sexual assaults and homicides, and I used to go nuts. I had a defense lawyer saying she wasn't hurt. And I, and, and I knew what he was saying, but I said, you don't have any idea of what you're saying. There are no bruises which healed, but she was hurt. She was raped. And there's a hurt that will be part of her life forever, so I'll try no argument, uh, because that one's not going anywhere with your guy. Uh, sometimes they say, well, at least he didn't jump out of the bushes. That was another conception. Well, if you talk to survivors, most of them would rather have had someone jump out of the bushes than be their trusted stepfather or uncle or neighbor or priest. And, and that, that does so much more damage. So, and then there's a the secondary victimization, and I, I, I don't have time again this morning to talk about that, but I do a lot of work in the clergy sex abuse area, the secondary victimization is clear in the clergy sex abuse. You've got offenders who did what they did, and then you had victims and family members and other people turning to an institution they thought were going to respond in a positive way, i.e. the church and the hierarchy, and they got re-victimized for a, in a variety of ways. And I don't have to explain to this room what that is. Um, 
If you talk to people, women, <coughs> women and men in the criminal justice system, victims will tell you as well that the harm that's happened um, often is by the judicial system, by the police, by the people that, that have responded to what happened, and that that harm really creates huge chaos. Okay. So, who was harmed? What was the harm? And the third question, the sort of intent, which really is different, but can be the same in mediation, is how do you repair the harm? How do you work toward repairing the harm? And that, that, is, that is really, uh, it's not simple. It's not just restitution. It may be the offender doing things for the, for the, for the victim. It may be making the restitution, if that's appropriate. But the community, as victim, also has responsibility as healer. What's the community doing to repair this time, to support victims, to support a, an environment that you're not going to have continuing harm? Sometimes it's providing services to an offender so that he or she can get a job, so they can make restitution, so they don't harm anybody. So it can be very holistic. There are lots of ways to look at that, of repairing the harm. But that is the focus. And a lot of people talk about restorative justice being rehabilitation of offenders. And I am very much in favor of rehabilitation of offenders, but that is not what restorative justice is in my world. And I can tell you that most of us that do this work, the focus is on harm and victims. It's not on any community. It's not on the offender. I can tell you that studies show that offenders are rehabilitated and, and are much less likely to preserve if, in fact, they have been through a sort of justice process. Because now they're being called as a human being to help repair the harm. And what I'd like to do in these last two, my last part of my talk is give you some examples. Uh, I've done, we've done training around the world, and I can tell you that restorative justice, and particularly victim offender dialogues, are being used in many, many countries. Uh, in many of the EU countries, um, and one of the ones that I have a deep familiarity with, as well as one spent time here, um, is part of the criminal code. It is available at any stage of the criminal proceeding, from the police station to post-conviction on the most serious crime. And what the, structurally, the government in Belgium pays two NGOs, one in the Flemish area and one in the, in the Walloon area, to provide full-time mediators to do victim-offender dialogues. Um, Austria provides an impressive uh, victim-offender dialogue. Um, a number of us spent time in Turkey. Turkey has enacted a law. There are lots of structural problems with the law. But the idea is to be able to do victim offender dialogues in the criminal justice system. Some people are doing it because they want to see old, let's say, cases moving. That's why mediators got a lot of jobs initially, or people, you know, they are taking too long. But the individuals who participate in these processes find such deep, deeper satisfaction than they do. So let me talk about just quickly a, a few cases and why they're so important. And I'm, I'm going to give you some examples of cases that are really sort of not traditional criminal cases. There, are, um, one of the things I've done for the last probably ten years is victim of uh, dialogues and crimes of severe violence. And um, the cases we do in the United States, on those, on those cases, they're always post-conviction. They can get work from three years after a serious crime. The latest I've done is a 40-year homicide where a little girl was infected off the street and stuck in the refrigerator and died. And uh, her brother, who was nine at the time, an adult now, human rights professor, wanted to meet with the offender who was still incarcerated in the United States. And so we facilitated that last summer. But, um, there are both and I'm going to tell you just partially, there is a lot of preparation. A year, a year and a half, sometimes two years of preparation with the parties before you put them together. I just want you to understand that. Um, and why do victims of crime, or survivors of crime, want to meet with an offender? A number of reasons. And it's the, it's the reason for almost all this stuff's working. It is the ability to be listened to and heard tell your story uninterrupted. At the heart of restorative justice, and much like one of many mediations, it's the chance for people to sit and listen for a little while, sometimes non-judgmentally, as to how you've experienced it. Um, and so 
um, uh, somebody who's had their daughter murdered um, wants to be able to look the person in the eye and get it and say, did she scream? Did she struggle? How long did she breathe before she died? And that, that can seem shocking. And I can tell you as a judge, when I first heard about this, I thought, this is nuts. No victim is ever going to want to do that. And I couldn't have been more wrong. There are lots of victims. And why do they ask me why they want to do it? Oh, what if the answer is terrible? They tell me all they do, and they have for whatever number of years since the time of the crime, is thought about the various possibilities. It could be this, it could be that. Did this happen? Did that happen? And they want to know. And I'll say, what is the worst possible answer? And they always say the same thing to me. He can't hurt me any more than he has. I need to know what happened. I want to know what happened. And there are some incredible moments. A friend of mine who, whose daughter was murdered and raped um, wanted to know her daughter's last words. And um, I, I did not facilitate this particular um, dialogue, but I've seen the tape of it. And the, um, the offender who admitted, we only do this for offenders who admit that they engage in some behavior, looked at her and said, I'll never forget what you daughter. Now she's been tortured and raped and murdered. He said, she looked up at us before she died and said, I forgive you and God to you and died. And the mother and the daughter of the victim fell into each other's arms, weeping. And they heard that, but the mother said that gave her peace. She found out 15 years after her daughter was murdered that her daughter died at a moment of peace. That she was not in absolute terror as she left this earth. And that gave her some satisfaction. Those things happen over and over and over in these meetings. And um, uh, so that's one of it. The other is to tell an offender face to face exactly what you've done. Um, one of the cases I did, which was not typically in the criminal justice system, it had been in the criminal justice system, there was civil litigation going on, and the lawyers asked me to facilitate it and not talk about settlement of the civil case. So we're, we're, you know, we're not doing a mediation to resolve it. We're doing a mediation for people to have a conversation about what happened. And it was a case where a young man, a young engineering student, got drunk, drove his car too fast, hit the ice, and ran into this couple. Um, and both the couple were profoundly injured. They both air lifted out. The man became permanently disabled in a wheelchair. The wife had major, major surgery. And their lives were basically destroyed. And it changed everything for their lives. And for the man, he lost his livelihood and ability to do his carpentry work. Uh, for the wife, it was like the end of her marriage. She now was a nurse to her husband and no longer a partner. And um, they were incredibly angry about some things the offender had said during the court proceeding. And um, the offender, like many offenders, understanding it did harm, but they had no idea of really what kind of harm. And so we prepared them and put them together. And um, the, the two, the couple wanted to meet individually with the offender because for the woman it was very emotional about the destruction of her marriage and the inability. And she looked at this young man and said, you're going to be able to play basketball with your children someday. If we're lucky enough to have children, their dad's never going to be able to play with him because he's paralyzed in a wheelchair. I want you to remember that. I mean, those kinds of things. And, and she went through all that with him and saying, you know, we no longer have a marriage. We used to go camping. We used to do all these things. We can't do any of these things. And of course, the young man is just tears rolling down his cheek as he listens to this. And I thought he say, how do I even say I'm sorry? How do I say I'm sorry? And we went through the whole meeting, and, um, you know, the offender was offering a mother in law and doing anything he possibly could. And, and at the end, um, they were sitting, and the, the wife, who was much more, was a very strong personality, looked at him and said, you know, you are a good kid. I know you're a good kid. You made a horrific decision that destroyed our lives. But this must have been very hard on your mother. I'd like to have lunch with her. They lived in different towns, and he, 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 he
And the next thing we know, they're exchanging emails so that his mother can have lunch with her to have that conversation. That's the kind of repairing the harm. When those people walked out, their lawyers who not said it and told me they had never seen them all so peaceful as they were after that moment. It, it's that kind of process that you can have the opportunity for. Um, the, um, there was a case that I had that was interesting. It was a medical malpractice case, not a criminal case. I got a call. The um, couple had had a baby at the hospital, something gone wrong during the birth. Um, the baby was hooked up to everything, you know, for about a week. Um, a number of other things happened, and finally someone, the doctor just came up and said, there's no brain activity, and walked away. And the hospital looked at the mic and said, what did he just say? And she said, I think she said our baby isn't alive anymore. And um, so the baby was taken off of life support and died, and they initially sued the doctor for medical malpractice, and I won't get into the, all those details, and the suit was filed. And at some point, the plaintiff's lawyer called me and said, my clients really just want to meet with the doc. Um, and they will dismiss the suit if she'll meet with them with a woman doctor. And um, all the doctor was mad and meet with the doctor. And she said, I don't want to meet with them. They're going to tell me how I should practice medicine. This wasn't my fault. And all the for lots of reasons. And, and, and some valid reasons. And uh, she was just mad at me. And, I said, you know, it's really your choice. I, they're willing to dismiss it. And uh, I actually got a co facilitator who was a doctor to co facilitate with me because I felt that they, the doctor needed somebody who had some medical training to be one of the other neutrals, what we call as neutrals, but two people in there. So he and I actually facilitated that in, their, in the um, his medical office next to the hospital. And we went through. And the, 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 the doctor was still mad, and I told the parents, I said, look, I have no idea what she's going to say to you because she's really angry. And they said, that's okay, we just want to talk to her. We want to tell her about all the bad things that happened in the hospital, even if she wasn't responsible for it. And so we went in, and, you know, they talked about the little daughter, and now they can't have children, and they talked about all the horrible things and some other things that happened in the hospital. And, what this all was like, and, and the fact that Dr. didn't come to the funeral, and, and they went through this whole thing, and I mean, it's really hard to listen to. The defense lawyer, the one I represented, I could also happen to be nine months pregnant at the time. But she really likes sitting here, you know, this is. And the doctor, I turned to the doctor, and I, I held my breath, I said a prayer, saying, oh my God, what is she going to say? And, you know, there's something that takes over those dialogues when you set that tone. And the doctor looked at it and said, you and I will never agree as to what caused the death of your daughter, but I have three children, and if that had happened to my daughter, I don't know what I would have done. That's all she had to say. She was acknowledging that they had suffered deep pain. There was no apology, and we get into that apology, that magic apology. There was no apology, but there was a, you know, an acknowledgement of their pain, and that she understood it. And then, the best thing that happened, and it happened from that lawyer, who I didn't particularly want to be there, we were all done, and one of the things the mother had said was, the only picture she had of the child was in the coffin, because they had been all hooked up to things, and, and she had a little bit of file there. And the pregnant lawyer said, as we were trying to get our things together, to the mother, I don't know if he would like this, but I would be deeply honored to see your daughter. He would like to take out the picture. And so the mother just beamed and she went through all the papers and she took out the picture of this deceased child in a white coffin. And we passed this picture around the room one by one, honoring this child. And it was, I mean, you could just feel the healing in that room. I mean, you could just feel this oh, um, and the parents, I don't know, I wrote a letter a year later talking about how that was a monumental moment. Um, you know, you can't orchestrate that, you can't plan that, that's organic, that's part of the media, just being present. Um, and, you know, and when you look at, if you go into other cultures or other countries where there's been genocide, where there's been horrible atrocities, people are looking for ways to heal. They're looking for ways to heal.
but there's fear, there's, there's injustice, and people who are trained, and the best thing I think those of us that are coming from a particular culture can do is help give techniques to people who are from cultures to be able to do that and do it in general cultures. There's no way that I can go in there and leave that kind of thing, and should. But to be able to say, here's what works here, structurally, we thought about that, where are the women, where are the children, how are you involved in this? Um, what, I, what I'd like to end with is just um, one last example um, and a letter written by a victim. Because ultimately, one of the things that's very different about mediations, as I mentioned, is it's victim focus. Am I okay on that? Okay. <laughs> I don't even think we're going on that. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, we talk about, a lot of the things we talk about in mediations are power imbalances and how do we handle power. And, you know, that's one of the many cool things we work on. In a victim offender dialogue, in a classic dialogue like that, there is a power imbalance, and we recognize it and leave it as is. The victim has the power in the room. The victim is the one who has been harmed. Now, you know, we get more complex for victims that are offenders and offenders or, or things in schools where they're more complex. But, but in a classic case where you've got a homicide or a sexual assault, and, and I, I warn the offenders when I'm preparing them, they're going to feel it because it's about what they did and the implications of what they did. And, um, and the victim feels it because they were the ones that were powerless generally during the crime, and they hold the power in the room. That doesn't mean they can stand up and pound on the offender, but you can feel it because they've got the questions, they've got the presentations. I've had victims re-autopsy reports to offenders. We, in a particular um, drunk driving accident where a young girl was we watched a videotape of her first communion and all her whole life, you know, as the offender just wept. And at the end was a picture of a car that was smashed to pieces because he ran a red light um, after he'd been drinking. And um, I, I want to just finish that because we talk about forgiveness, and forgiveness is not part of disorder justice. It's, it's often an outcome, and that's a whole other talk, but forgiveness is defined very differently by different people. And we're very careful about that's the victim's journey, um, what that definition means. Um, and I always tell offenders, you can't expect you're going to hear it. It happens in a lot of cases. It's wonderful personally if I hear that, or there's a hug at the end, but that is not one of the requirements or goals that we set out. It may be a goal of the victim, which is fine, but it's not one of our goals. Um, but in this particular case, um, where we saw this whole film, there was a whole family um, of a girl who'd been killed in that accident. And then there was one daughter who was in her car of 20 and who was having a real hard time. I think she participated primarily because her family did. She said, I'm not going to even look at him. I said, that's fine. You can just sit there and listen to your parents. And, so she sat there and she looked down through the whole thing. And then when her sister's uh, video was up, she was kind of watching it. And the tears, of course, were running down the cheeks of this young man who had done this. And she reached into her bag and she pulled out a box of Kleenex and she pushed it across the table to him. That was the forgiveness that I saw. Whether you call that forgiveness, whether you call that something that was some empathy for the human being on the other side, who had done a terrible thing, but she saw something else in him at that moment. And that was one of the values of restorative justice. So I'm going to end. This is a, um, and I've talked a lot about drunk driving, but those are ones that, that I downsized that, that often wind up there. But I had a case um, where, again, yeah, this wasn't. Totally, it was a young man smoking marijuana, and he, the young woman had stopped her car with another passenger on the highway. And the, the father of the victim said, The minute I met him, he said, I want to meet him because I want to make him the best possible person he can be because I want to give meaning to my daughter's death. I remember the hair going up over the back of my neck thinking, Would I ever be in a place to say, that's what I want shortly after the, the, the death. 
But the mother was probably more like I would have been, which is still enraged about what happened and, and the senselessness of my beautiful 20 year old daughter being murdered uh, by a drunk driver. And um, so, and I said to her at the time, Why do you want to do this? And she said, I don't know. And I said, Well, you know, part of this journey is to figure that out before we meet with them. And so we went a whole year before she met with them. And at some point I asked her if she wanted um, to, him to write her a letter because he was a very remorseful young man. We had met with him. And she said, Well, that'd be okay. And she, um, she wrote her a letter and she wrote a response and I, I, I'm going to end by sharing this letter because this really is sort of the heart of the story of justice and fits into lots of civil disputes, it fits into international disputes. Uh, it's kind of the relationship between humans of the brokenness that happens when the great harms happen and finding a way of peace. Uh, and she's giving me permission to read this. Um, Dear Mr. Sharpen, thank you for your letter. After reading it for the first time, I was left with the feeling that the words were honest and straightforward. I realized what writing this was not easy for you. Through your words and what you've described, it is clear you are going through the process of self-reflection. It is apparent that you are dealing with the aftermath of January 9th, 2005, the of the accident, and moving on with your life in a positive way. On um, reading the letter, it's evident that no one who survived this tragedy has escaped the pain and anguish resulting from the accident. The stages of grief and guilt are similar to the intense feelings of sorrow and emotional pain. The reality of Moira, and Moira is the girl's name, death is a part of my life that cannot be denied. There's not a single day that I do not agree her loss. These four years, I have continually worked through my grief spiritually, emotionally, and physically. With the grace of God, the love and support of my husband and son, many signs from her, as well as the compassion of family and friends, I walked the path from denying her death to not wanting to continue on in his life to anger and depression, to acceptance, and finally to embracing the grief and moving forward. A major turning point in the process for me was the full realization that my daughter, will always be a blessing in my life. We're not want well, neither any of us to be stuck in the non-productive stages of grief. Maura, a kind and loving person, wanted to make others feel happy. She would not want me or anyone to withdraw from life and to succumb to a state of lasting depression. She goes on and just giving an advice and talking about the importance of not comparing one's life to that of others. Only unhappiness comes from comparing. And she ends by telling him that she forgives him. Uh, she accepts his apology and hopes that in the future he will find greater peace and joy in his life. They went on to have a meeting that was very emotional, um, lots of tears. And a year later, he wrote her a letter and saying how he was still struggling to go on with his life. But he had a picture of her daughter next to his computer that he looked at every day because he never wanted to forget what had happened. So it is, it is, I can tell you that the work of restorative justice takes all your emotion as a restorative justice practitioner. Many of you participate in mediations that that happens in civil cases as well. And, and um, you know, it really calls us to the highest level of mindfulness and self-reflection as mediators and trying to be peacemakers and who open up spaces for conversation and for finding peace. Um, I want to again applaud the organizers of this conference. I have never seen a conference with mediation and restorative practices put into the same conference. And I think it's brilliant because I think it's the answer. And I hope the rest of the conference goes very well. See you tomorrow. Thank you.